so let's think about this. Um, what numbers are a distance of three uh, away from zero? What numbers are a distance of three away from zero? So uh, we can think of it on the number line. It's a really easy answer, right? Here's zero, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. This direction, negative one, negative two, negative three. Right, so here's a number line with x. And so what numbers are a distance of three units away from zero? Three and negative three. Three and negative three, right? Here are the two uh, results. Good. Uh, what if instead of three, it was just, you know, four? What units are four, uh, what numbers are a distance of four away from zero? Well, again, so easy, straightforward, obvious. It's that guy and that guy, okay? All right, well, you know, mathematicians, we, we, we're lazy. We don't want to write out that whole sentence there. So we came up with a way of describing that exact same question right there. And that is what this is. Absolute value of x is equal to 4. Okay. The absolute value notation is a way of asking, is a way of describing the distance away from 0. So some number has a distance away of 0 equal to 4. What are those possible values? So one answer is x equals to negative 4. And the other answer is x equals to positive 4. When you see this, when you see the, just the absolute value of uh, negative 4, this is instructing you to find the distance that this value is away from 0. So it's asking for this, this distance away from there. And distance is always positive, right? The answer to an absolute value is always a positive. So this is 4 units away from 0. That's why we get a 4. And when you see the absolute value of positive 4, well now it's asking you for the distance that 0 is away from 4. So you get that distance right there. Distance is always positive, and so it just equals to a 4. Okay, so the absolute value of negative 4 is 4, the absolute value of 4 is 4, okay, but um, it's a distance away from 0. I know that some people memorize this as it takes away the negative, uh, but that's just memorizing a process without really thinking about what it really means. And in order for us to really get this section, we've got to go a little deeper than it takes away the negative. Right? So it's not just that it strips away the sign. It's true. It does do that. Of course, if there's a minus in there, and then there's no minus in there, and there is no minus in there, okay? So there is the pattern that if there is a negative inside the absolute value symbol, it takes it away and it makes it positive. It makes everything positive. Right? If it was already positive, then it stays positive. But really, it's about this distance. This notation is asking for the distance that that value is away from zero. Okay? Good? All right, so that's the description of what an absolute value is. So number one, for instance, if we had to solve this, what's the absolute value of, absolute value of x equals to 7? What's the answer there? Okay, so there's two answers. x equals to 7 is one solution case one. And the second option is x equals negative seven, right? They're both true. If I go back and replace the x there with a seven, I'm going to get a true statement. Seven, absolute value, does equal to seven. True. And over here in this case as well, absolute value of negative seven does equal to seven, uh, so also true. Good? Questions, comments, sisters? Okay, pretty easy. All right, so this is one of the cases we're going to run into. An absolute value equals to a positive number. By the way, can an absolute value ever equal a negative? No, right? The answer always has to be a positive answer. What about this one? How about absolute value of, let's make it like 3w minus 2 is equal to 9. Okay, what can we get? Um... Well, 
the, in this case, what you want to do is think of this as one single thing. Whatever is in there, if it was a positive 9, that would be one solution. Or if it was a negative 9, that would be one solution. So we set whatever is in there equal to 9 or whatever is in there equal to negative 9. Uh, uh, so we could do this. So case 1 is 3w minus 2 equals to 9. And case 2 is 3w minus 2 equals to negative 9. So same like over here, whatever was in there, we set it equal to positive, And then whatever was in there, we set it equal to its negative. Okay. And now we got two different cases, and we can solve for w in each one separately. So plus 2, we end up with 3w is equal to 11, or w equals to 11 thirds. We can turn that into a, uh, a mixed number of 3 and 2 thirds as a mixed number, or w equals to 3.67 to do that two decimal places. Over here, we add 2, add 2, we get 3w equals to negative 7. So w equals to negative 7 thirds, which is fine. Or we can turn it into a mixed number of negative 2 and 1 third, or w equals to negative 2.33. Uh, Any questions? No, no, no. If this part here is a little confusing, you can also do this. I don't always do this, but we can do this where we let uh, a substitution happen, like let u equal to 3w minus 2. And then we can take the original statement of this equals to 9, and then we can break it up like we did over here. Right, so we can set the original one, replace this with a u temporarily, then we'd end up with u equals to 9 as a case 1, and as a case 2, we'd end up with u equals to negative 9. Okay, so we sort of solved it, except that they uh, didn't ask us about this u thing. You introduced that yourself. So we'd have to do a substitution again and solve for the question they asked us about. So then you'd go back and replace 3w minus 2 equals to 9, or 3w minus 2 equals to negative 9, and then you'd end up with the same answer. So you don't have to do the u substitution, but sometimes it's useful to think about that way. Good? Okay, so sometimes it's a very straightforward absolute value with a single variable in there equal to a positive number. Very easy. Break it up into two pieces like this. Sometimes whatever's in there is just a little bit more complicated like this one, but it's still an absolute value equals a constant, so you just break it up. Whatever's in there is equal to positive 9. Whatever's in there is equal to negative 9. That's the other kind of question we'll run into. So what if we had something like this, uh, 3w minus 2 about times uh, 4 minus 5 is equal to 13. Something like that. Okay, so now we have like a little algebraic equation, uh, but uh, there's an absolute value in there. So this is similar to the following. Let u equal to absolute value of 3w minus 2. And so it's the same thing as thinking about this. 4u minus 5 is equal to 13, right? So instead of, just think of this as one solid thing. And now we can solve for that thing on its own. Add 5, divide by 4, right? So we end up with 4u is equal to 18. And, oops u, not w, for u. So u is equal to 18 divided by 4, which is 4 and a half. u equals to 4 and a half as a mixed number, or u equals to 4.5. Good. Or 9 over 2. Okay, so that's great for you, but we still have to go back and answer the original question. So uh, we get that u, which is equal to this. So absolute value of 3w minus 2 is equal to 9 over 2, using this form of our solution, 9 over 2. You can also use a mixed number or a decimal. So now we go back to this, and now we get to break it up into cases. That's how we get rid of these absolute values. 
The only way to eliminate the absolute values is to break them up into cases. We have to use our logical cases to break them up. And so we'd end up with case number one. Whatever is in there must be equal to 9 over 2. 3w minus 2 equals to 9 over 2. Or case number 2, uh, 3w minus 2 must be equal to negative 9 over 2. So solve for w in each one of these. So plus 2, we get 3w equals to 9 over 2 plus 2. Putting a little 1 there, multiplying by 2 over 2. I get 3w is equal to 9 over 2 plus 4 over 2. Or 3w is equal to 13 over 2. And then I'm going to multiply everything by 1 third times 1 third times 1 third. I get W is equal to 13 over 6, or 2.5, or W equals to 2.5. Good. Questions, comments, issues? No? 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 Okay. Uh, same thing over here. We're going to add 2, add 2. This will be 3W is equal to negative 9 over 2, plus 2, put a little 1 there, so times 2 over 2. I'll get 3w is equal to negative 9 over 2 plus 4 over 2, which means 3w is equal to negative 5 over 2, or negative 2.5. And then multiply everything by 1 third times 1 third times 1 third, which gives me w is equal to negative 5 over 6. Good. Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? No? Okay, so this was like a little equation where one of the, the, there was an absolute value sort of buried in there. So it's very important to leave this alone. The absolute value, whatever's in there, leave it alone. You got to isolate it. You can do this U substitution thing if you want, if it helps you to isolate it. But you don't have to. You could just add 5 and divide by 4 and get to this stage right away. Right? So it's not really necessary to do this U substitution. This is useful when it gets really confusing. It's a nice little uh, intermediate step to get to your answer to do this substitution. But maybe at this stage it's not that confusing yet. So maybe it's not that important. Uh, so that's fine. If you don't need this U substitution part of it, that's okay. You can go directly from there over to there by adding 5, dividing by 4, get to that point, and then you can uh, solve for it. What you cannot do though is distribute the 4, that's not allowed. You cannot add 2 to both sides, that's not allowed. You cannot divide everything by 3, that's not allowed. While we have an absolute value, you can think of it as like a locked box. You cannot mess with it. You cannot put things into it, you cannot take things out of it. You gotta leave it as a, uh, as a locked box, you gotta solve for it, uh, isolate it, and then the only way to unlock it and get rid of the absolute values is to apply this logical statement. And this logical statement can only be applied when the absolute values are by themselves equal to a positive constant value. Then we can separate it and break them off into pieces. Okay? At least that's what we've done so far. Okay? You're also not allowed to break them up right now. So, you know, the idea is that whatever is in here equals to this positive, or whatever is in here equals to this as a negative. Right? That's how we separate them. But you can't do that here. You can't set this equal to 13 and set this equal to negative 13. That's also not allowed. Okay? Good? Questions? Comments? Issues? Okay. So the other kind of thing we're going to run into is going to be an equation similar to this one, except there might be more than one absolute value in the equation, but in, uh, in a more limited case where the absolute values are all the same. They all look the same. Okay, so let's take a look at this one now. So now we have an equation, uh, a linear equation, right? And we have some absolute values thrown in there. We got this one right in here. Here's one of them. And then here's this other one over here. Okay, don't start doing things like distributing a 5 and getting 10p plus 25. You can't do that. You can't mess with an absolute value that way. Don't, you know, subtract 5 from both sides or something. You can't do that. We got to leave it alone as a single unit. If you'd like to do a substitution, that's fine. So replace these absolute values by some letter. 
let u equal to absolute value of 2p plus 5. So we'd end up with 5u minus 1 is equal to 8 plus 2u. Okay, well now it looks a little simpler. So we want to solve for u. Get the u by itself. Uh, I'm going to minus 2u there, minus 2u there. That gives me 3u minus 1 is equal to 8. Plus 1, plus 1. I get 3u is equal to 9. And so I get u equals to positive 3. Good? Okay. Or, you don't have to do this whole u thing. Uh, we could go back to the original statement. Uh, we got 5 absolute value. 2p plus 5 minus 1 equals to 8 plus 2 absolute value, 2p plus 5. Okay, so these are the absolute values right there. I can subtract two copies of this absolute value. 2p plus 5 and subtract two copies of it here as well. So then these simplify to three copies of absolute value of 2p plus 5 minus 1 is equal to 8. These guys all cancel. And then plus 1 divided by 3, we can get the same result. Absolute value of 2p plus 5 is equal to 9. Three out here. Divide both sides by three, and we end up with two p plus five is equal to three. Good. So same thing. We could have gotten over here. Good, 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 good. Okay. So now we are back to one of the more simpler cases. We have an absolute value equal Wait. to a constant. Yeah. So can you show that one for you? Could I show what? We're done here. The, the last step here is to replace, right? We recognize that we solved it for you, but nobody asked you about you, they asked you about this. So the very last step is to substitute the u with this and say the u is really equal to 2p plus 5 absolute value equals to 3, which is the exact same thing as that. So you just don't have to bother with the u. Sometimes it's nice to uh, do it because the original statement might be so ugly that it just gets cumbersome to try and rewrite it all the time and keep track of all those absolute values. So it's a nice shortcut sometimes, but you don't have to do it and you get the exact same answer. Right? So either way, we gotta solve this right here. 2p plus 5 in absolute values is equal to 3. What's the value of p that gives you a true statement? And so this breaks up into two cases. Either this is positive 3, right? Pick a p value that will result in a positive 3 inside here, which that will give us a true statement. Or pick a p value such that inside here we end up with a negative 3, and that way we end up with that, right? I mean, we could probably just kind of think of it on our own if we kind of push, push ourselves hard enough. How do we get a positive 3 in here? What kind of p value can I get? How do we get a positive 3 in here? What kind of p-value? Negative 1 will do it, right? Negative 1 times 2 is negative 2 plus 5. That's going to be positive 3. Good. So uh, what else? How do we get a negative 3 in there? Well, I need this to be negative 8 plus 5. That's equal to negative 3. So I need the p to be equal to negative 4. Right? So those are going to be our two answers. But if it's too difficult to kind of do it, the brute force method of just staring at it and knowing the answer, then we can separate it into pieces. Let me put this up here. So we got 2p plus 5 equals to 3. So one of the options, case 1, case 1, is going to be 2p plus 5 equals to 3. So minus 5, minus 5, I get 2p equals to negative 2. So therefore, p equals to negative 1 is going to be one of the answers. And the other answer, case 2, is going to be where 2p plus 5 is equal to negative 3. Uh, and so minus 5, minus 5, I get 2p equals to negative 8. 
And so P equals to negative 4 is another one of the answers. Any questions? No? 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 Okay, we can always check it by going back to the original statement. Let's replace all these p values there and there with a negative one and confirm that the left hand side really does equal the right hand side. And then come back over here and replace all these p values with a positive, I'm sorry, a negative four. Negative four there, negative four there. And then confirm that in fact we do get a true statement from there. Okay, so uh, what else can we have? We have cases, we've gotten through cases where we have a very simple uh, absolute value equal to a constant. We did a case like that. We did a case where we have something a little more complicated inside the absolute value equal to a constant. Uh, we did that. Uh, there's cases where there's only one absolute value in a linear equation. So we can solve for it and solve there. We can do cases where there's uh, more than one copy of the absolute value in a linear equation like this one but luckily they're both identical so that I can bring them together and combine them like we did here. So uh, minus two copies of that on both sides and then five copies of this absolute value minus two copies of the same absolute value gives you three copies of it. Okay, uh, the other case is a little weirder. What if we have two absolute values that are not identical to each other and they equal to each other? So let's think about absolute value of x is equal to the absolute value of y. The fact that we're using two different letters there uh, is, is indicating that they're not necessarily the same quantity, right? The same value. Um, so what kinds of values, but, but they're allowed to be the same number, they just don't have to be, right? Um, so what kinds of numbers can I put in here? If I make a list of possible x and y things that I can plug in to make this a true statement, for example, I can make this a 3 and make that a 3. That's true, right? If I make them both 3's, I get a true statement, right? There isn't going to be a single unique answer like before. There's lots of answers. They could be they both 3. Or maybe they're both negative 8, right? They could both be negative 8, that's true. Maybe they're both 9. Maybe they're both negative 3.2. Right? Yes, these are all. Okay, uh, what is the pattern I'm doing so far? So far, I'm choosing both of them to be the same. The same. Okay, so that's what I'm doing right here. Uh, both x and y are the same number. Okay. All right, well, is that the only way I can choose values to make that a true statement up there? What if I chose 3 and negative 3? Won't that also work? Because the absolute values make them both positive, so they, all, they still end up being equal to each other. So 3 and negative 3. Or maybe negative 8 and positive 8. Or maybe negative 13 and positive 13. Right? So what's special about these kinds of answers? There's an infinite number of them, but it's not anything, right? I can't just choose like 7 and 13. That's not true. So there's something special about this. There's a certain pattern. So what, how do we describe these kinds of answers over here? These are the answers where the x and the y are same distance, same distance away from 0. It's a great way to describe it. These two are cases where the x and the y are the same distance away from 0. Okay, what's another way of describing it? On the number line, what about the number line? They're the same distance away from zero on the number line. Okay. What's special about them when we add them? They always add up to zero. That's another way to describe them. Pick x and y so that when you add them, they add to zero. Right? Pick x and y so that they add to zero. That's true, right? They always add up to zero. What's, what's another way of describing two numbers that always add up to zero? They're additive inverses of each other, right? That's the fancy math word for this. Two numbers that add up to zero are additive inverses. Okay, but that's not the direction I want to go in. 
let's go back to basics. What's another real basic thing? What if I only gave you one side of these, like let's say I did that, and I said, how do you find the other? Given one of them, what do you do to the other one? How do you, what do you do to this one to get to the other one? It's almost, you just described it, right? They're almost the same except they're the opposite sign. sign, right? So if I give you a three, you know the other one would be negative. negative three. And so you get it by getting this one and multiplying by a negative one. All right, what about in this case? Get this one and it's the opposite sign. So the opposite sign would be positive eight. So if you grab this number and multiply it by a negative one, you'll get to that one. And same over here, if you grab this one and multiply by a negative one, you'll get to this one, right? The two numbers are the same uh, distance away from zero. You can describe it that way. They're the same uh, magnitude but opposite signs, right? They're the same values with opposite signs. That's another way of describing it. Um, or you can verbally describe that uh, given, given one number, the other number is mm, the same the same number with opposite sign right like if one of them is negative the other one is positive or one is positive the other one is negative Okay, so how do we use some math uh, notations to describe these two things? Well, this one's really easy. How do we choose the x and y? I want both in, uh, x and y to be the same number. So we just say here that x is equal to y. That's how we describe this right here. So one possible way of getting solutions is that x equals to y. Just pick the same number. Now this covers the cases where they're both equal, but it also covers the cases where they're both negative. I'm sorry, it covers the cases where they're both positive and it also covers the cases where they're both negative. Whether positive or negative, doesn't matter, they're both equal to each other. The absolute values really didn't do anything at all. They were already uh, equal to each other prior to applying the absolute values. Now this one's a little bit trickier. We want to describe that they're almost the same number, right? They're almost the same. I almost want to say that. Almost. Except one of them is positive and the other one is negative. So if I did this right now, this would be like setting, this would be like setting the negative 3 and the positive 3 equal to each other. That's not true. They're not equal to each other. They're off by a sign. But if I take one of them, and it doesn't really matter which one, but I take one of them and multiply it by a negative one, then it will be equal to the other, right? If I go back over here and I choose to multiply this first one by a negative one, then it will be equal to the other one. If I choose to multiply this one by a negative one, then it will be equal to the other one. And same thing with this one, right? They equal each other once you pick only one side of it and multiply it by a negative one, okay? So those are the two cases. Either negative x equals to y or x equals to negative y. So you got to multiply one side of the equal sign, not both. Sort of, kind of, maybe. Okay, let's do an example. Uh, let's say number 24, for instance. We have absolute value of 2p minus 4 is equal to absolute value of 5 minus p. Okay, so this is a case where we have two absolute value of statements equal to each other, but they're not identical. They're very different, right? So this is one of those cases. So this is going to break up into case one. Case number one was the case where they both equal each other. The absolute values made no difference. Whatever you plug in there, they're equal to each other. So that'll be 2p minus 4 is equal to 5, 5 minus p. <clears throat> so 
tying it back to what we were just doing, if we had absolute value of x equals to the absolute value of y, case number one would be that x equals to y, and case number two would be the case where they're almost equal to each other, except we got to make one of them negative, and it doesn't matter which one, so let's just choose that one. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. So we have two absolute values equal to each other. The things inside the absolute values are not the same. So we break it up into two cases. Either they are equal to each other or they're almost equal to each other, but one of them has a negative one distributed through it or multiplied times it. Okay, so we already got case one for, our, for us. This is like our x. This is like our x. This is like our y. So this equals that is one case. And the other case will be case two uh, will be that this 2p minus 4 is equal to 5 minus p, almost equal to that, but we've got to distribute a minus 1 times all of that. Okay? Good? Questions, questions, questions? Okay, so let's figure these out. Now that we've um, uh, put them into these two cases, we can just solve for p. So plus p, plus p, we get 3p minus 4 equals 5. Plus 4, plus 4, we get 9. So 3p equals to 9. So p equals to 3 is one solution. On the other hand, we got to distribute that minus 1. So minus 1, minus 1, we get 2p minus 4 equals to minus 5 plus p. And then minus p minus p, we get p minus 4 equals to negative 5. And plus 4 plus 4, we get p equals to negative 1. Okay, so let's check it. What's going to happen when I type in a 3 into the original statement? I'm going to get that whatever is in here is equal to each other and the absolute values made no difference. That was the first case, where the, the x and the y equal each other and it makes no difference what's inside there. Uh, I'm sorry, the absolute values make no difference. So check p equals to 3. We'll get 2 times something minus 4 in absolute values is equal to 5 minus something. So if we type in a uh, 3, we get 6 minus 4 is equal to 5 minus 3, so that would be 2 equals 2. Yep, that's a true statement. Right, it worked out. And notice that it would have worked out even without the absolute values. We didn't need the absolute values. Whatever was inside the absolute values was already equal to itself, to the other side. Okay, the other one, let's check if p equals to negative 1 is a solution. So 2 times something minus 4 in absolute values is equal to 5 minus something in absolute values. I'm thinking maybe negative 1 is an answer. So here we'll get negative 2 minus 4 in absolute values is equal to 5 plus 1 in absolute values. So we're going to get negative 6 in absolute values is equal to positive 6 in absolute values. And that's also going to be true, right? Because the absolute value removes this negative sign, makes it a positive 6. So we'll end up with 6 equals 6, also true. So true statement, true statement, they both worked out. Good. So again, this turned out to be the case where the two things inside the absolute values um, were already equal to each other. They both equal to positive 2. Whereas this resulted in the case where the two things inside the absolute values were almost the same, but they were opposite signs. If the absolute values weren't there, they would have been, you know, it wouldn't have been a true statement. But then the absolute values come in, make both sides positive, then they're both equal to each other. Questions? Okay, so let's take a look at inequalities now. So back when we were just doing this thing, let's say we had equals to 3, then we said that the answer was x equals to positive 3 or, uh, uh, or negative 3. 
So here's 0, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4. Right, so this is on the x axis. So the answers are this one or this one, right? We can just put some solid circles on there to represent that. I can replace the x with a 3, or I can replace the x with a negative 3 and get a true statement. Well, what if we had this? Absolute value of x is less than or equal to 3. What kinds of values can I replace the x by and get a true statement? So obviously 3 is still going to work. Negative 3 is still going to work. But what about 2? What about 1? What about 2.5? What about negative 2.5? Right, so if we think about the number line, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, So uh, negative 3 will work, so we'll put a circle there. Positive 3 will work, we'll put a circle there. Uh, but so will 0. Absolute value of 0 is, is less than 3. Absolute value of 1 is less than 3. So really it's everything trapped between negative 3 and positive 3. Good. So when the inequality is pointing uh, at the absolute value, so the absolute value is less than a positive number, we get a situation that looks like this. Uh, I like to think of this as a little house there, right? We're dealing with zero. So here's my little house there. And you get to go within three blocks of the center. Right? When you're a kid, you're riding your bike, your parents tell you you can ride your bike three blocks within three blocks of the house. That means you can go three blocks this way or three blocks that way. You're within three blocks. Good. Okay, so it's all the numbers between these two. We can describe it as x is less than or equal to 3, but greater than or equal to negative 3. Right? All the values trapped between negative 3 and 3. This is really a combination of two different inequalities. It's saying negative, all the values that are less than or equal to 3, right, satisfy that condition. But at the same time, it's got to satisfy this other condition that x has to be greater than negative 3. So we'll put an and statement here. And uh, x is greater than or equal to negative 3. So really we have this and this inequality with an and statement. That's what this middle, middle section is. So we'd rather express it this way than with two separate inequalities. Any questions? So, as we move forward, whatever is in there, we put in the center here. So, if we run to any, into an inequality that's a lot more complicated, like let's say, for example, it's the absolute value of 3x plus 2 divided by 7, absolute value is less than or equal to 3, then we just think of this as one solid unit, and that's what goes right in here. So, it's not going to be our final answer, we're not going to be done yet, but in order to translate that into something that we can work with, this is saying that the solution will be all values where we have negative 3 less than or equal to this 3x plus 2 over 7 less than or equal to 3. And then we could proceed after that. We'll do an example like that in a second. Okay? But whatever it is, we have an absolute value less than or equal to a constant. It turns into this situation. Good, good, good. Okay, the other one we're going to run into is what if we have the absolute value of x is greater than or equal to 3? That one's a little more confusing, sort of. Okay, so let's think of the number line again. So here's our number line. We have um, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 2, 3, 4, 5, 8, 9, 10, um, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, negative 5, negative 6. There they are. Okay, what kinds of values of x, right, this is the x number line, what kinds of values of x can I put in there in order to get a true statement? Well, I can obviously put in a 5 or a 7 or a 13, right? Really big positive numbers of x will give us a true statement. So, uh, starting there, I can put a dark circle because it's greater than or equal to. And I know that big positive numbers going that way are going to be part of my solution set of this guy like 4 or 5 or 6 or 7, right? The other uh, possibility, though, is to put in really big negative numbers, like over here, this negative 3, and going in this direction, 
is also going to give you solutions like negative 5 and negative 6 and negative 13 they will also give you true statements so there's two parts of the number line two sections of the number line that will describe a solution this side over here can be described by x is less than or equal to negative 3 and this side over here is described as x is strictly greater than or no, greater than or equal to positive 3 and either one will be an answer. Do you see how this is an or statement? Because this number or this any numbers over here will be an answer or any numbers over there will be an answer. Over here we need an and statement because the solutions have to satisfy both statements. If I just focused on one statement like x is less than 3, uh, well then negative 18 does satisfy that one. It just doesn't satisfy that one, and as we can see, it's not going to be an answer, right? Or x is greater than negative 3. Well, 7 is greater than negative 3. 7 over there satisfies this condition. It just doesn't satisfy this one, and I know it fails to be a true statement. So over here, we need an and statement because the solutions have to satisfy both conditions. It's got to be less than 3 and greater than negative 3. At the same time, both conditions satisfy, both, an AND statement. Whereas over here, the solutions are an OR statement because it's only got to be one or the other. It's got to satisfy this statement that it's over here, the answers are less than negative 3, or the answers are greater than positive 3. Good? And just like this one over here, if this had been something more complicated, instead of just a simple X, something like this, uh, then we would just follow uh, our rules and set whatever's in there to be less than uh, negative 3 or whatever's in there to be greater than positive 3. We'll do an example like that in a second. Any questions so far? Alright, so let's try and solve this one. Uh, 5 minus the absolute value of x minus 2 is strictly less than 4. Um, so what we want to do is isolate this absolute value first, leave it alone, don't mess with it, don't add 2 to both sides or try and distribute anything. We got to isolate it first, then we got to determine which of our two logical statements is this. Is the absolute value greater than a constant or less than a constant? Uh, and then we'll apply our, our two cases from there. So I'm going to first of all subtract 5 from both sides and I'll get minus the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than negative 1. Do we got to change the direction of the inequality? Do we have to change the direction of inequality? No, right? Only when I multiply or divide by a negative number, and there I was just subtracting 5, so that's not going to do it. However, now I have to, right? So I have to divide this side by negative 1, divide this side by negative 1, and this is where I got to change the direction of the inequality. So I end up with absolute value of x minus 2, is got to be greater than 1. Okay, So the things that go in here, possible answers are going to be really big numbers, bigger than 1, right? Whatever goes in here has got to be bigger than 1, uh, or bigger than negative 1, like negative 3 absolute valued is greater than 1. Okay. okay, so we break this up into two pieces. This is going to be a case where um, well, let me do this. Let w equal to x minus 2. So let's do that substitution for a second. That means I end up with w in absolute values is greater than 1. Let's think about that. So w is greater than 1 in absolute values. OK? So on the number line, here's the w number line. Remember, it's not the x number line, because I did this substitution. On the w number line, I need values to be bigger than 1. So here is 1, 2, 3. So possible answers are answers that are bigger than 1. So that's those over there. Right? If I put in a, negative, a positive 2, a positive 3, anything bigger than 1 will make this a true statement. But also, if they're um, big negative numbers, there's negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. If I replace the W with a negative 2 or a negative 3, that's also going to give me a true statement. So the answer to the W's is this picture. 
right? Which means that the W must be less than, strictly less than negative one, or the W must be strictly bigger than one, right? Those are my two answers for W. And that would be great if they had asked me about W, but they didn't, they asked me about X. So I still have to go one more step and replace that W with this. Uh, and so we get that X minus two must be less than negative one, or x minus 2 must be greater than positive 1. Those are our two cases. Now again, if you feel comfortable, if it, if it helps to understand it by doing this substitution here for a second, then great. Otherwise, you can go from here to there directly. This must mean that whatever is in there must be bigger than 1, or whatever is in there must be less than negative 1. Okay, so now we... Uh, Solve for x here, I'm going to add 2, add 2, we get x is less than 1, or add 2, add 2, I get that x is greater than 3. So now on the x-axis, I can describe this solution, here's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, negative 1, so x is less than 1, open circle going in this direction, and then x is greater than three, would be open circle there at three, going that way, and this is the solution on the x-axis. Questions, 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 questions? No? Are we gonna have to graph it for the test? Sometimes, yes. So you can express your answers as an inequality uh, statement or a graph. Good. Yeah. So for, um, sorry, I can't see, but uh, for the first one where it's x minus 2 and the absolute value, um, in order to go to from there straight to the other one, you just need to uh, multiply by negative 1. So it's not a matter of uh, that. You have to think about the, you know, the situation you're in and the cases. I mean, there's really no difference between that and here. So when the absolute value of W was greater than one, you just got to think about the cases. This has to be bigger than positive one, or this has to be less than negative one. And that's the same thing you have to do here. You have to recognize that in order for this to be true, whatever is in there has got to be bigger than positive one. That's how you get this statement, X minus two is bigger than one. Or whatever is in there must be less than negative one, right? A really big no positive number or a really big negative number. So you, it's just a logical statement that you have to think through and come up with the two cases that satisfy it. Really big positive numbers or really big negative numbers satisfy this one, right? Um, let's try one more. Okay, so let's solve this one now. Uh, this one is a case where the absolute value has already been isolated and it's less than or equal to a positive number three. So this is the case where they're between two values, right? So the, the solutions that can go in here are going to be all the numbers that are between negative 3 and positive 3. Like 0 is an answer, 1 is an answer, right? Whatever is in here has got to be the values between negative 3 and 3. So from that I know that this can, uh, uh, can be simplified as negative 3 less than or equal to 3x plus 2 over 7 less than or equal to positive 3. Okay? And now we need to solve for x. So we have a three-part inequality. Make sure you keep track of these inequality symbols here. So whatever operation you do to one part of the inequality, you must do to all three parts. So we're going to multiply all three parts by 7, for instance. So negative 3 less than or equal to plus 2 over 7 less than or equal to 3. I'm going to choose to multiply this by 7, which means I multiply that by 7, which means I multiply that by 7. I'll end up with negative 21 is less than or equal to, these guys cancel, 3x plus 2 less than or equal to 21. Then I'm going to choose to subtract 2, subtract 2, subtract 2. I'll end up with negative 23 less than or equal to 3x is less than or equal to 19. And then I'll end up with negative 23 less than or equal to 3x less than or equal to 19. Okay, then I'm going to divide everything by 3. 
So divide every, dividing everything by 3, we get negative 23 divided by 3 is less than or equal to x, less than or equal to 19 divided by 3. Uh, those fractions don't simplify, so you can leave them alone. You're done there. Or you can convert them into a mixed number, might be a little easier, or a decimal. So this is negative 7 and 2 thirds. So this would be negative 7.67 less than or equal to x, less than or equal to 6 and 1 third. So 6.333. So that's another way to describe it. Might be a little nicer than the, than the uh, improper fractions. And then we can just put that on a number line as well. Okay. On a number line. This would be all the values trapped between these two. So your 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So it's going to go kind of a third of the way through there. So here is a solid circle to represent 6.33. And then in this direction, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, negative 5, negative 6, negative 7. Negative 8. Uh, so here around there is going to be a solid circle to represent negative 7.67, <coughs> trapped between negative 7 and negative 8. And I know that the answer is all the values trapped in between those. Okay, so all those numbers trapped in between those should make a true statement of the original one. What's a really easy one to check? Zero. Zero is in there, right? Zero is in there. So it should be true that if I put a zero in there, the whole thing should be a true statement. So that would be two sevens. Is two sevens the absolute value of two sevens less than or equal to three? Yes. Yeah, it's just going to be two sevens, right? It's a small decimal. Okay, that doesn't confirm that this is absolutely true, but it does show me that I'm on the right path at least because I checked one of them and it was true. But to really check, I'd have to you know, confirm that every number in here really is a solution to this. So, can't confirm every single number. Any questions? No? Let's take a closer look at the graph of y equals the absolute value of x, or otherwise, in function notation, f of x equals the absolute value of x. Okay, so whenever you are dealing with a new equation and you're not really sure how to graph it, uh, one good place to start would be by creating a table. So let's start creating a table uh, of values and graphing those individual ordered pairs. So a good place to start is by letting x equal to 0. So if we let x equal to 0, that means that we'd be looking at y equals the absolute value of x, uh, where x is 0. So the resulting value would also be 0. And we'd be graphing this point right here, 0, 0, on the x and y uh, rectangular grid system. Okay, so now if we put on a 1 here, then we put a 1 into here, y equals to the absolute value of 1 is going to also be equal to 1. And that's going to graph this point. So this is 2, halfway between is a 1, and so right here we'd have the point 1, comma 1. Uh, let's create a couple more points. Uh, 2, the absolute value of 2 is 2. And the absolute value of 3 is also 3. Okay, so we start to see a pattern here. Five comma 5. Okay, so we start to see these points over here. Um, now in the other direction, uh, if we type in a negative 1, well, a negative 1, uh, if the absolute value of negative 1 is positive 1, so it becomes this point right here. x equal to negative 1 results in y equal to positive 1, which is this point right there. Let's try a different one. If we try negative 2, then the resulting uh, value after we apply it to the absolute value function is going to be positive 2. Right? That's what the absolute value function does. It removes the negative. It's technically the distance that number is away from 0. And so negative 2 goes up to 2. And then negative 3 gets mapped to 3. And negative 4 gets mapped to 4. And so we start to see a pattern that begins to emerge. Now I just very conveniently picked a bunch of integer values 
uh, but it's not true that you can only input integer values. Uh, for instance, instead of a 2, I could have typed in uh, 2.456, and I know that that would result in 2.456, and that would have resulted in 2.456. Right? So, uh, again, another... Uh, all that happens is that whatever you input in here, we get the exact same output. Uh, that's what the absolute value function would do. Okay, so we can continue to type in uh, points, and the pattern we see is if we input a positive number, we get the exact same value out. And if we input a negative number, we get the same magnitude making it positive. It just strips away all those negative signs and makes it positive. And if we keep going, we'll see that we end up getting points that come along this direction and along that direction. And if we did it over and over and over and over again, eventually we'd start to see something that looks like that. So this purple line represents the graph of y, uh, of y equals the absolute value of x. Okay, so now let's try and solve this one. This one is way harder than the stuff we've been doing because, okay, it's an equation, true, and it's got absolute values in it, true, we've done that before, except in this case, the absolute values are not identical. So we can't just bring them together and combine them like like terms. Uh, this one is, this one's rough. So the way to solve it would be to isolate one of the absolute values, like say this one first, set it equal over there, and then I apply our logical ideas that it's either whatever's inside there equals to exactly what's on the opposite side, or that's equal to the opposite sign of it. And so we end up with two cases, and then each one of those ends up with two other cases when we solve for the other absolute value. It's just, it's just not fun. Um, let me think. Should I solve it? Nah. Um, so we're not going to solve this. You're not going to have to solve this on your own by hand. So um, when we run into something like this, we're going to have to take advantage of our calculator. There's a great shortcut for solving things like this. Um, and we've done it before. The pattern is to set that equal to y sub 1, set that equal to y sub 2, right? So we're going to set up this, y sub 1 is equal to the absolute value of x plus 1 minus 4, and y sub 2 is equal to 1 minus the absolute value of x. We'll cover how to do that in a little bit. Um, well, actually, I guess we have time. So let, let's do that on our calculator real quick. Let's type these guys into our calculator. So y sub 1 is this, y sub 2 is that. I'll show you how to do it in a second. <laughs> Okay, so you turn on your calculator, right? To turn on your calculator, you might be in some weird screen. Either hit clear to clear that or quit to get back to the main screen. Okay, we're going to go over to y equals and we're going to type in our two equations. Our first equation is y sub 1 equals to the absolute value of x minus 1. To type in the absolute value, you got to go over where it says math, math, and then use your arrows to go to the right where it says num. And then the very first one is ABS. ABS is absolute value. Hit enter. Now the newer calculators, the newer software will automatically give you the bars that are like absolute value bars. And then you can get type in inside the bars. But the older calculators like this one write ABS. Okay, so we type in the X, minus, uh, X plus 1 inside there. And then close parentheses. And that represents the absolute value of X plus 1. Okay, so absolute value of x plus 1 minus 4 is the first equation. And the other one is 1 minus 1 minus the absolute value of x. So math, num, enter for abs, and then x, close parentheses, enter. Okay, there's our two equations. Make sure there's no other equations that could bother us. And also, very important, make sure that the plots are deactivated. Because one of, one of these plots is dark, that means it's going to try and graph the scattergram, the little dots. And that might cause a problem. Okay, so uh, now we're going to go over to window. You know, by default, try negative 10 to 10 for X and Y. It's a good standard default setting to try. If it doesn't work, we can very easily come back and change things. So let's try that and see, we'll see what happens. And then hit graph. 
and there is one absolute value, and there's the other absolute value, I can see that they do cross. There's an intersection here, and there's an intersection over there. Okay, so I'm gonna find those two intersections. Remember that to find intersections, we're gonna use the button that says calculate. So second, calculate. The fifth option down says intersect, and then we follow the instructions. It says first curve. Notice for a second that if I use my left arrow, see how the little cursor is traveling along that V? And if I use right, I'm still traveling along that V. So left and right travel along one function. And if I hit up once, it'll jump over to the other curve. And then if I go left and right, I will travel along that V. See, I'm traveling along that one. Okay, so there's only two, so it's kind of silly that it asks you to select them. But later on, when there's lots of them, then it might be important for you to tell it which two you want to see crossed. Okay, but for now, there's only two. So you hit enter to pick the first one. It automatically jumps to the other one. See the little cursor jump to the other one. I hit enter again. So I've selected the only two graphs on my, uh, on my screen. And now it says guess. And now this is important because uh, unlike in the previous uh, chapter, there's more than one place where they cross. So here's one guess. I want to guess this one right there. Where do they cross right there? I hit enter and I get two comma negative one. Two negative one. Okay. Now let's find the other one. So the other one is over there. I'm going to hit second calculate. Intersection down, the fifth option down. Ah. Enter. And then, uh, again, I can use my arrows to travel left and right on a curve. So I hit enter to pick the first curve, hit enter to pick the second curve, and then guess. I'm going to go all the way to the left, and right there, that's my guess, this one right there. Hit enter, and I'll get negative 3, comma, negative 2. Negative 3, comma, negative 2. Okay, so those are the intersections. Now, how do they answer the original question? Let's go back to that now. Okay, so when we graphed it on our calculator, we got something similar to this. Just not as cool because it wasn't in color, but we got one graph to be the red one and the other graph to be the blue one. So, roughly, just a really, really rough sketch. This is the Y there, this is the X there. There was something that came up this way and there was another one that came up this way and went that way. So we found from our intersect function that this one was the point 2 comma negative 1 and that this one over here was the point negative 3 comma negative 2. That guy right there. Okay, so let's explore what it means for this one to be a solution to the original system of equations, which is this. It means that if we replace the x and the y with this ordered pair in both of them, we will get a true statement. So it means that... Because this is a solution to the system of equations, it means that negative 1 is the answer when the absolute value of 2 plus 1 minus 4 is used, and that negative 1 is the answer when 1 minus the absolute value of 2. Right? So all I did is I replaced the x and the y with these two numbers right in there into both equations and they both give me true statements. It is true that 3 minus 4 is negative 1 and 1 minus 2 is negative 1, that's true. And so now, because they both equal negative 1, I can set them equal to each other. So 2 plus 1 minus 4 must be equal to 1 minus absolute value of 2. And so these guys here are absolute values. Right? And if we compare that to the original question, we look at the original question and have this, x plus 1 minus 4 equals to 1 minus x. So clearly, the 2 is the x. Good. So if we go back to the original questions, it must be true that the 2 is the x. Got it? Okay, so that's the trick. The x coordinate of the intersection of the system of equations is the solution to the original one. And if we do the same thing with the other one, the other ordered pair, we'll see that x equals to negative 3 is also a solution to this. 
So the ordered pairs are not the solution to the original one, but the x coordinate of the solutions of the systems of equations are the solutions. So the solution to this is x equals to uh, 2 uh, and x equals to negative 3. That's the solutions. Good? Questions?